The following audio is from Christian Heritage Church. More information about Christian Heritage Church is available at chctoday.com. Has anyone here ever felt like Moses? Felt like you tried to do what God wanted you to do, but somehow you messed it up, and then things just didn't go right. Sometimes things that we think are going to be great end up in absolute failure. Have you ever felt that way? Ever felt like it didn't matter, it just didn't work, and now I don't know what to do? It's kind of like Murphy's Law always applies in your life, you know what I mean? Always applies in your life. We need to understand that God wants to move us beyond that place. It kind of reminds me of the story of the guy that was baking Weta cakes for a living. And he had an order come in, and the young lady said, I want you to write 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 on the top of the cake. Well, he's kind of like me, and his handwriting wasn't the greatest, so when he made the cake, he wrote John chapter 4, verse 18 on the top of the cake. 1 John 4, 18 says these words, There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. That's a pretty good verse for the top of a wedding cake, right? But this is what he put on it, John 4, 18. You've had five husbands, and the one that you now have is not your husband. <laughs> Sometimes it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. So when it doesn't work, what are we going to do? Moses knew he was called to be a deliverer. God's hand was on his life from birth. His parents had sown that into his spirit, into his heart, and into his mind. He knew what his destiny was. When he was 40 years old, he tried to take matters in his own hand, and you know the story. He killed an Egyptian, buried him in the sand, and then someone found out about it, so he ran for his life to the backside of the desert, Midian. As far away as he could go from Egypt at that point in time. And he didn't know what else to do, so there we find him when we pick up our text from Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but was not consumed. Then Moses said, I'll turn aside, and I'll see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. And when the Lord saw he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Verse 5 says, then God said, draw near this place, take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. When God chose to encounter Moses, he did so with a very unusual event that was contrary to nature, a bush that was burning but was not consumed in order to get his attention. So I want you to recognize this morning that God will go to great lengths to get your attention. For Moses, it was that burning bush, the bush that never consumed, even though it was on fire. I wonder what it takes for God to get your attention and my attention today. When Moses saw the burning bush, the Bible says that he walked toward the bush, and when God, you can read it one more time, In uh, verse 3, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush doesn't burn. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside, then he called out to Moses. You see, God will put things in our life to get us to stop, to turn, to look, to listen. So my question to you this morning is, what is God placing in your life? Or what has he placed in your life to get your attention? What did God say to Moses when he spoke? He said, take your sandals off, you're on holy ground. We understand that's a custom even yet today in many parts of the Eastern world. That when you walk into a church or a synagogue, you take off your shoes or your sandals. It's a custom that really crosses all religious lines in that part of the world. You walk into a mosque, you remove your shoes. Many times preaching in the East, I've often been required to take my shoes off before I delivered the word because that was part of the culture. So I understand that. But I believe that this statement, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground, had more than just cultural ramifications. I believe it was God's way of showing Moses three things. Number one, you can write it down if you're taking notes. Number one, he was trying to get him to slow down. Slow down. Have you ever been in the desert? Anyone here ever been in the desert? Several of you have. A few of you haven't. Well, let me tell you about the desert. The desert is hot. The desert is rocky. 
The desert is hostile to human environment and to human habitation. And when God said to Moses, take your sandals off, he's trying to get his attention to slow him down so he can speak into his life. Years ago, and I've been to the desert in Africa and Mexico, all across the West and the Southwest, and one thing I learned is that everything in the desert either bites, stings, or sticks. That's just the way it is. So when God was saying, take your sandals off, he was slowing Moses down. He had to be careful where he stepped. There might be a hot rock there. There might be a thorn there. There may be something that would bring harm or damage to him if he just continued to blow through life. Now listen to me. Sometimes God gets our attention just to slow us down. Just to cause us to focus on him. Just to cause us to hear his voice. What has God done or what is God doing? What has God done to get your attention? He wanted to slow him down. Secondly, I think he wanted Moses to think more about God than he did his own comforts. Because Moses had to stop in that place and listen to the voice of God. I don't know, the scripture doesn't tell us, but I really believe God really hadn't messed much with Moses for 40 years. He abandoned his destiny when he fled to Midian. And now that God had heard the cries of the Israelites, he was coming back to Moses to say, it's not over till I say it's over. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. You've written yourself off, but God is saying, it's not over until I say it's over in your life. And maybe this is the moment he has ordained for you to get your attention, to get you to stop, to get you to slow down to get you to listen to his voice. He wanted Moses to be more concerned with hearing him than with his own personal comfort. Do you realize sometimes serving God means that we give up some of those creature comforts in order to pursue him and follow him and hear from him on a regular basis? I don't know what you're talking about. Well, sometimes it means we get up an hour early so we can open the book and read the word and talk to him and commune with the Holy Spirit. That's putting away that comfort, isn't it? Sometimes it means we turn off the television or we shut down the computer or we lay down the iPad or the iPhone so that we can hear the voice of God. Sometimes God is trying to get us to a point where we focus more on Him than we do our own comforts. We need to recognize that's an important key in understanding our assignment and in doing what God is asking us to do. There's a lot of things in life that will not make you comfortable when you're following God, but they will always be rewarding when you choose to listen to the voice of the Father. We've got to get that in our spirit. For too long, we've been coddled, and we think it's all about me. I've got news for you. It's not. It's all about Him. And sometimes there's a level of discomfort that comes into our lives so we can hear the voice of God. I think the third thing that God was trying to tell Moses when he told him to take his shoes off was you're not going to run away from this one, son. You remember 40 years ago when Moses did what he thought he was supposed to do and it didn't work out the way he thought he would? What did he do? The Bible says he fled, he feared, and then he fled. He ran. He ran to Midian. God says, take your sandals off. You're on holy ground. Take your sandals off. I want you to be a bit uncomfortable. Take your sandals off. I want you to focus on me. Take your sandals off. You're not running anywhere. It's time to stop running, folks. And let God guide and direct your life, even if it may be not be what you think is his desire for you. Problem in Western culture, we're way too busy. We don't have time to give God our undivided attention. We place our own comforts, our own desires ahead of God's will and God's priority in and for our lives. Take your shoes off because I don't want you running anymore. Sometimes all we do is run. From the moment the alarm goes off in the morning to the moment we lay our head down on the pillow at night, we're just a constant circle of motion. God wants us to stop, to consider to listen, to hear his voice, to begin obeying him. I believe he said to Moses, take your sandals off so he could get his attention and begin speaking into his life. I'm going to ask you this morning, will you make it a point to find a time in your day? It doesn't matter if it's the start of the day or the end of the day, but find a time in your day when you stop and hear the voice of God. 
Open the Word and let the Word begin speaking to you. The Holy Spirit illuminates the Word. It brings life into your heart and into your mind. Direction for you each and every day. Oh, when you're discouraged, lift up the Word of God. When you don't know what to do, turn to the Word of God. When you're depressed, let Him encourage you. Come on, church. It's time to make a conscious effort to hear the voice of God in our lives. God said, take off your shoes so I can talk to you, so I can get your attention, so I can redirect you. And when you read the scripture, it says that God, in the verses we didn't read, verse 6, 7, and 8, God said to Moses, I've heard the cry of my people in Egypt, and I'm ready to deliver them, and you're the guy I've chosen to do that. You're the guy I've laid my hand on to accomplish that mission. Do you understand today that God has a plan for each one of our lives. It's not the same. Your plan is not the same as mine. Your assignment is not the same as mine. Nevertheless, he has a plan for your life. He wants you to know and understand when he gets you your attention, it's for the purpose of speaking into your life, for the purpose of directing you, for giving you guidance to helping you begin to follow him as he desires to do it. He spoke into Moses' life because he was the one destined to be the deliverer. Now remember, we talked last week about those who invested in Moses' assignment. We talked about his parents. If you weren't here last week, you can watch that sermon at chctoday.com. You can get it on iTunes, thanks to Doug Apple and Wave 94. Uh, you can buy a CD or a DVD. Anything you can do, but you need to hear last week's message. We talked about the fact that his parents invested in his life. We talked about the fact his sister invested in his life, and even Pharaoh's daughter invested in his assignment. And so when God came back to Moses literally 80 years later from the time of his birth, he knew he wanted Moses because he needed someone who knew the language, familiar with the customs, the policy of the court, and who could get an audience with Pharaoh. Moses was the son of the previous Pharaoh's daughter. He could get an audience with the Pharaoh. The average Hebrew down there working like a slave would never get the attention of the Pharaoh. But God had set Moses in the position where he could use him to bring the children of Israel out of bondage and into the promised land. So he got his attention with the burning bush. This morning, let me ask you, what's required to get your attention? Think about it for just a moment. What has God done in the past? What is God doing today to get your attention? And this isn't a one-time thing. He wants to communicate with us on a regular basis. So what is he doing to get your ear, to cause you to stop and listen to what he's saying and speaking into your life? I believe many times, especially in the Western church, we don't want to hear God because we don't know God. You need to let that set for just a moment. We don't want to stop and hear God because we don't know God. He might ask me to do something that is too big or too great or too grandiose. Can I tell you, if you understand the Father, you understand that any time He speaks something into your life, He's already stored up the provision. He's already made the way. He's already paved the path. And all you have to do, my friend, is follow Him. Well, I don't know. I'm not sure I can trust him. You need to turn back to the Word and get to know him a little better. Because Jeremiah 29, 11, it'll be on your screen, says these words, I know the thoughts that I have for you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to bring about an expected end. I know what I think. He's already got a plan for you. Read it. It's right there. Peace and not evil to give you hope and a future is what the new King James says. The King James says an expected end. You see, God already has a plan for you. But when we don't trust him, when we don't want to stop and listen to him, it's because we don't understand that fact. We think somehow, some way, his designs for me are evil. They're bad. They will turn me the direction I want to go. No. He says, I'm going to give you hope and a future. What greater promise is there than that? Hope and a future. But in order to do that, he first has to get our attention. How does God get our attention? Let's talk about that for just a moment. You might want to write these down. Number one, he gets his attention through his word. He still speaks through his word, friend. Psalm 119, the Bible says in verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. 
Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, 6 still yet says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall what? Direct your paths. That's exactly right. The Word brings light, illumination, direction, and guidance into our hearts and into our lives. But folks, if the only time we open the book is on Sunday morning, we're not going to get a lot of direction. We're not going to get much guidance. You see, it's impossible for me to download in 30 minutes everything you need in your heart and in your spirit to make it through a week. It requires that you and I become students of the Word of God, disciples of the Scriptures, and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak His Word into our life to give us guidance and direction. You say, I don't know what to do. James has the answer. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. You say, I don't know which direction to turn. The Word has the answer. Isaiah 30 says, and you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. It's all through the Word. Oh, so many times, instead of listening to God, instead of stopping and spending some time in the Scripture, we turn on the TV to listen to a preacher. Oh, listen to me. I'm not interested in what God regurgitates through someone else. I'm interested in the Holy Spirit speaking directly into my heart and into my life. That's the promise of the New Testament believer. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not minimizing preaching. But I'm saying if all of your nourishment comes from what somebody tells you, you're getting it in the wrong place. You need to get it in the Word of God. The Word will never steer you wrong. I told you a few weeks ago, you need to know the Word so that when I'm standing before you, if I say something that doesn't align with it, you know it, and you can come and talk to me about it. I pray that never happens, but there's always that possibility. That's the position we need to be in when we're students of the Word. He speaks through His Word. Number two, He speaks through His Spirit. I already mentioned it. You'll hear a voice behind you, Isaiah 30, 21, saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Is that the only instance? Absolutely not. Acts 13, 21, the Spirit said, separate Barnabas and Saul for the work I've called them to. He also uses dreams and visions. Acts chapter 10, Peter didn't know what to do when he had a vision of unclean animals coming down and God saying, rise, kill and eat, until he was called to the household of Cornelius, who happened to be a Gentile, and God said, I want you to preach the gospel to them. Direction and guidance come through those ways. Acts chapter 16, verse 9, Paul said, I didn't know which way to go. And then I saw, and he means in a vision, a man from Macedonia saying, come over and share the gospel with us. God uses those things. Now again, let me qualify it. If you're getting direction through dreams and visions, make sure they align with the word of God. Amen? God's not going to tell you to do something stupid. He's not going to tell you to do something contrary to his word as he guides you and directs you. And then sometimes God uses circumstances. Let me say it this way. He prefers to speak to us through his word by his Holy Spirit. He will use dreams and visions to give us guidance and direction. And I believe his default, his last option, is to use circumstances, pressure, discomfort, even pain at times to get our attention, to cause us to turn back towards him. You say, I'm not sure I believe that, Acts 13, 15. Paul and Barnabas were preaching in Antioch. The Jews were so violent against them. It says they shook the dust off their feet and went on to Iconium. You'll see that again and again throughout the scripture where God uses circumstances to bring his will about. Even in Acts chapter 15, verses 39 and 40, you'll find the story of Paul and Barnabas getting ready to go on their second missionary journey. And Barnabas wanted to take John Mark who John Mark had went the first time, but about halfway through, he became a mama's boy and he went home. It was too tough. He cut out. So when they were ready to go again, Barnabas said, let's take John Mark. And Paul said, I'm not taking that crybaby. I'm not putting up with that wine and I'm done with that. And the contention, according to the scripture, was so sharp between them, the discomfort. Do you understand what I'm saying? The pain in the relationship was so strong between them, they went their separate ways. Paul took Silas, Barnabas took John Mark, and they had two missionary journeys rather than one. But the point is, that point of pain brought about the will of God. 
You know, when we think about that and we realize that God speaks to us, then it's up to us to obey. We have to also recognize we really only change for three reasons. Unfortunately, the main reason we change is because we heard enough we have to. Just got to change the circumstance. Secondly, we change because we learn enough we want to. And that's a great thing, a great place to be. But the third place is really where we should start, where we receive enough we're able to. Where the Holy Ghost downloads the Word and the will of God into our heart through His Word and through encountering Him that we desire to do what He wants us to do. We receive enough, we're able to. So God begins to get our attention. When He gets our attention and when He lays out His plan for his li- our life, we have two options. We can obey or we can make excuses. When we look at our text this morning, Moses chose the latter. Does that surprise you? Does that surprise anyone? Boy, I feel like I'm preaching to an empty church this morning. Either this stuff is really heavy or everybody wants to sleep, one or the other. I don't know which. Kind of like the guy who came into service and slept through the whole thing. And uh, he got up before the preacher was finished and he said, Hey, where are you going? He said, I'm going to get a haircut. Why didn't you do that before you came? I didn't need one when I came. That's the way we are sometimes. (laughs) Stay with me this morning. We're getting to some good stuff, I promise. Moses chose excuses rather than obedience. So God had to continue the process in his life. Look at the scripture. It says the first thing you can open your Bibles open to Exodus 3 verse 11. God said, I want you to go back to Egypt and I want you to deliver the Israelites. And this is what Moses said. But why me? What makes you think I could ever go to Pharaoh and lead the children of Israel out of Egypt? Why me? I have no qualification. I have no ability. I can't do this. Why me? God got Moses' attention when he was living as a shepherd. I believe he was really at one of his lower points in his life. You'll recognize that the occupation of the shepherd in that day of time was usually reserved for teenage boys. But here's Moses, an 80-year-old man, still working as a shepherd. It's an interesting thing. He's not in a metropolitan area. He's not living the high life. He's on the backside of the desert, cut off from everyone and everything. His life had been reduced to the predictable, to the routine. There was no, no challenge or excitement. It was just mundane and humdrum and day after day after day. And suddenly God shows up, says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to lead my people out of Egyptian bondage. That was his wake-up call. And what did he say? Why me? What makes you think I can do this? Have you ever argued with God? Anybody? Oh, I have. I've argued until I'm blue in the face, until I'm out of words. We argued with God about coming to Tallahassee. We don't want to do that. That's not your will. You surely don't know. God, what makes you think I can do that? Have you ever said that to him? What makes you think I can do that? You see, you're really not that much different than Moses. All of us have that same excuse. It's a matter of whether or not we're going to make it or whether we're going to obey. What makes you think I can do that? Do you realize how stupid that statement is? Have you really thought it through? What makes you think he's talking to God? He's not talking to Nimrod on the next mountain. He's talking to God. What makes you think I can do that? How stupid is that? Who is God? He's only your creator. He's only your maker. He's only the one who gifted you. He's only the one who was a plan for your life. And you're asking him, what makes you think I can do that? Glenn Burns, I bet you said when God called you to run the rescue mission, sitting on that Baptist pew, what makes you think I can do that? All of us have said that at one time or another. But it comes to the point where we have to say, you know what's best for me. You have a plan for me. You have a will for my life. You're going to lead me into the destiny that you have already provided. I'm going to quit arguing and quit making excuses. Last week, I started the story telling you the story of the homeless man I met in Oklahoma City. Didn't tell you his name. His name was Rod. And I had uh, been going several weeks, and you'll remember the story, meeting with him on an afternoon with a Dr. Pepper and a Snickers candy bar. I'm sorely disappointed. I didn't get a single Dr. Pepper or a single Snickers candy bar last week. we got to try this again, all right, folks? All right. You want to get into my favor, 
Dr. Pepper Snickers candy bar. Yeah, I know, Alyssa, you started, but you forgot, so that doesn't count. No, nope, no, no brownie points. I'd go down of an afternoon, find him under a shade tree somewhere around the mission, take a Dr. Pepper and a Snickers, and we'd just sit and talk. This happened week after week after week. And after three or four months of just visiting with him, trying to get to know him, because I knew there was something in him that God wanted to pull out. I told you the story, lost his wife and family and went off the deep end, left a successful career and found himself homeless in Oklahoma City. After a period of weeks, actually about three months, I went on a missions trip. I was gone for a couple of weeks. When I came back, I had to catch up, so I didn't have time that week to go down there. But the following week, it was about four weeks since I'd seen him. Went by, got the Dr. Pepper, got the Snickers candy bar, drove down around the mission, drove several times, couldn't find him, finally parked, went inside, asked the director, where's Rob? He said, I don't know. You know, he's homeless. Those guys move. They're here, they're there, and they're everywhere. We haven't seen him for a few weeks. I was disappointed. I just said, okay, God, whatever you're doing, send someone else to do it in his life as well. Send another voice. Send another influence to that man. And one about it and forgot about it. Three years later, I had left the pastorate, and I was helping with an inner city church in Oklahoma City. I showed up one Sunday morning, and there were maybe 50 people there. It was a pretty small crowd. And I noticed a guy that looked really familiar, but I couldn't place him. Didn't speak to him, didn't talk to him, left. The next Sunday morning, I went back, and the guy that I saw the week previous, shaved, hair combed, clean clothes, bright eyes, was waiting on the steps with a Dr. Pepper and a Snickers candy bar. He said, do you remember me now? I said, yeah, you're Rod, aren't you? I've been praying for you. I can't say I prayed for him every day, but every time God brought him to my mind, I would pray for him. God, speak into his life. God, give him a voice. God, guide him and direct him. And I can't tell you that he went back to his medical practice, but he was working a job. He was clean and drug and alcohol free. His life was back on the same path, not because of me, but because God got his attention and turned him around. Listen, folks, you need to be aware that God wants to get your attention. He wants to turn you around. He wants to invest in your life. He wants to put you in the position that he wants you to be in. You'll remember when I first met that man, he asked me this question. Is there any hope for me? It's the question the world's asking. Is there any hope for me? It's a question many in the church are asking today. Is there any hope for me? I've come to tell you, God has a plan that includes peace, hope, and a future. If you'll simply plug into him and let him move in your hearts and move in your life. God wants to do something great in you and through you. So Moses said first, what makes you think I can do this? And then he remembers, oh, I can't because of my past. I killed an Egyptian. I can never go back there. My past will haunt me for the rest of my life. And some of you in this room have felt the same way. I fell off the boat. I fell off the wagon. I messed up again. God could never use me. Can I tell you there's a great difference between Old Testament redemption and New Testament grace? You want to know what it is? Let me tell you what it is. In the Old Testament, the blood of bulls and goats were offered once a year when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies as an atonement for the sins of Israel. So once a year, for this little millisecond of a time, they could feel they were in right standing with God. But when you move, and in the Old Testament, the Bible says he took our sins and put them as far as the east is from the west. It says he puts them behind his back. It says he casts them in the sea of forgetfulness. But when I cross over into the New Testament, and when I crack open Hebrews chapter 8, it says the blood of bulls and goats cannot redeem man, but the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, once and for all, serves as a sacrifice and brings redemption. So I've come to tell you this morning, your past can be put under the blood. It's not repositioned. It's removed. It's not covered. It's cleansed through the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, somebody needs to get a hold of that because that's for you this morning. You need to understand your past does not disqualify you for stepping into the present, for stepping into God's will for your life today. What you did yesterday can be put under the blood and God will move you forward. 
Secondly, Moses said, I don't have any authority. You can read it in chapter 3, verse 13. I'm reading from the message. Then Moses said to God, suppose I go to the people of Israel and I tell them, the God of your father sent me to you. And they ask me, well, what's his name? What do I tell him? What is he saying? He's saying, whose authority am I going in? Under whose banner am I marching? Whose authority do I make this declaration? You know what God said? He said, tell them, I am that I am has sent you. I am that I am has sent you. Some of you in this place say, I would love to do it, but I just can't. I don't have the authority. I've come to tell you, I am has sent you. And if you'll get a hold of the great I am, he will make you what he wants you to be. And you can say, I am because of I am. I am because of what God is doing in me and through me. So we need to understand the authority that we live under. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. All right, let's pause for just a moment. I need some help. Leave that verse on the screen for me. Now, read it one more time. Will you read it that out loud with me? Whatever you ask out loud, that means you speak. Whatever you ask. All right, let's try this again from the top, shall we? I've already messed that up big time. I feel like Moses this morning. Here we go again. Take another lap around Mount Sinai. All right, one more time from the top. And whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So now let me ask you very quickly. If he said, if you ask anything in my name, Jeremiah, what can't you do? Uh, everything. That's right. You can do anything in his name. What is prohibited from you doing the will of God? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. What quality, what, what caveats did he put on that scripture? Did he say, you can do anything in my name if you do what you ask. What you ask. You see, when we understand that, when we begin to apply that, we understand the authority that we are living in and living under. It's not a matter of Steve Dow saying it. It's a matter of the Son of God saying, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's why we can declare his word. That's why we can declare his will. That's why we can stand in faith and authority. Not because of us, but because the great I am has already declared it. That's why I can pray the prayer of faith and believe people to be healed. That's why I can pray for God to bring in lost souls and believe them to be saved. That's why when there's no money in the bank, I can turn to the king of kings, the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and I can say, I need a deposit from your account into my life today. We need to understand the authority under which we operate. Authority is useless, however, unless you step into it. When God said, Moses, tell him I am that I am, has sent you, until Moses went back to Egypt, That promise was vacant. He had to step into it. He had to take a hold of it. You can quote the scripture all day long, but until you take a hold of it, until you step into it, until you say, that's mine, it's just words on the page. But when you take authority, when you assume what he's given you, when you step into that position, then supernatural things begin to happen and occur. God could have said all day, I am that I am has sent you. But if he never left Midian, it was pointless. He had to put some feet to his faith and walk to the place God wanted him to be in order to take that authority and prove God's power in that place. I love the story in Acts chapter 3 because it's a great illustration of the authority of Jesus Christ flowing through his people. You know the story, Peter and John were going to the temple at the hour of prayer. There's a lame man sitting at the gate, beautiful. There's no doubt in my mind he sat there every day for his entire life. He has his little cup. He's asking for an offering. If you've never been in that culture, you don't understand how prevalent beggars really are. They're everywhere. All of them asking for an offering. All of them with malady or disease or deformity of some type, unable to fend for themselves. So often, their family brings them to a public place and sets them there so they can ask for offerings. This guy had been sitting there, no doubt in my mind, his whole life. He was lame. He couldn't walk. 
held his, up his cup and he asked for an offering. You remember what Peter said in Acts chapter 3? If you don't flip over there and read it, he said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He stepped into that authority. John chapter 14, he stepped into that authority. And from that moment, when he took that authority and he walked in that authority, the power of God was released. And the Bible then goes on to say, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leapt to his feet and began leaping and walking and praising God for what God did in his life. Now listen, it would never have happened until Peter stepped into that authority. Some of you need to get that today. You've been living powerless lives. You've been ran over by the devil. It's like a bulldozer has knocked you down and then set on top of you because you don't understand the authority God has given to you. It's time to get your back up. It's time to get mad at the devil. It's time to say, I'm not going to put up with this nonsense any longer. There is a higher power at work in me. His name is Jesus Christ. And he said, whatever I ask in his name, he's going to do it. Come on, folks, get it in your spirit. Begin walking in the authority that God has already laid out for you. Number three, he said, I have no ability. Acts chapter four, verse, or excuse me, Exodus four, verse 10. Moses raised another objection. This is number three, all right? Again, remember, he had an interruption. God gave him direction, and then he made excuses. Excuse number three. Suppose I, excuse me, master, please. I don't talk well. I've never been good with words. Neither before or after you spoke to me, I stutter and stammer. The next verse isn't on the screen, but if you have your Bible open, you need to read it. God says, who do you think you made your mouth? Who do you think made your mouth? Are you getting what he's saying to Moses? This is a bunch of nonsense. Let's cut to the quick. Let's get past it. If I can, and you have to back up a few verses. If I can take that rod that was in your hand, and when you throw it down, it turns into a snake. And when you pick it up by the tail, it turns back into the rod. And if you can slip your hand into the bosom of your shirt, and when you bring it out, it's leprous, and you put it back in, then it's it's normal and it's clean. If I can do all of that, don't you think I can take care of your speech problem? Listen, some of you have been saying way too long, I can't because. And you offer up some flimsy excuse. Can I say it like God said it? Who do you think made you? And if he's calling you, if he's positioning you, if he's putting you in a place to use you, quit worrying about what you can't do and step into that authority and let him do it through you. Because here's the key. He's really not interested in what you can do anyway. He's interested in what he can do through you, what he can accomplish by you when you yield to him. Number four, he said, I don't have any desire. I have no desire. That's a lot of us in Christianity today. You want me to do something for God? Forget it. VBS, you've got to be kidding me. Go walk the streets of Tallahassee, not in my wheelhouse. You want me to, you want me to come and clean the church? Do I look like a janitor? What we're saying is, I have no desire. See, Moses said in Exodus 4.13, he said, Master, please send somebody else. Oh, we're great at that, aren't we? You know, God, I can't do it, but I know someone who can. God, I really don't think I can do that, but I've got just the guy for you. Let me tell you who you really need to be talking to, because it's not me. I don't have the ability, I don't have the qualification, I don't have the authority, but the bottom line, I just don't want to do it. That's what Moses really said. He said, I don't want to go back to Egypt. Why did he make that statement? Because he remembered 40 years earlier when the Pharaoh wanted to kill him. Because he had killed an Egyptian. He fled as a fugitive. He ran for his life. And, and this is where I'm driving for this whole message. It's the point number five. He understood that the thing motivating him was fear. Fear of what his past had brought into his life. And you can read it. Finally, after all those objections, God addressed Moses' fear. He didn't address his fear first. He addressed his fear after he ran out of excuses. After he had nothing else to offer God. You see, this is the point. 
God knows what's in your heart. God knows what motivates you. God understand what, understands what makes you tick and what propels the decisions that you make on a daily basis. So he allowed Moses to walk through this whole charade of reasons why I can't do what you're asking me to do to finally address what was the root in his heart. And the root in his heart was he was afraid of his past. So look at verse 19. From the message it says, God said to Moses in Midian, he's still back there, saying, go, return to Egypt because all the men who wanted to kill you are dead. Now listen, sometimes God lets you run through that whole laundry list of reasons why you can't to bring you to the point where he can address what's really motivating you, what's really keeping you back, what's really preventing you from stepping into your destiny and doing what God asked you to do. It wasn't until Moses went through all these excuses that God finally said, you don't have any reason to fear. I've already handled what happened back there. All those guys that wanted you dead are dead themselves. Oh, listen to me. Every lie of the enemy, it's dead in Jesus' name. Every excuse from yesterday, it's dead in Jesus' name. Every habit that's held you back, it's dead in Jesus' name. Everything that you said disqualifies me has already been buried in Egypt. It's time to raise up and say, I will no longer fear, but I will do what God's asked me to do. Fear is holding you back. It's going to make you come up short. In one statement, God blew all that away. We're living in a very difficult time in America. A time when we really don't know what tomorrow will hold. We don't understand what's in our future. Some will speculate, some will prophesy, some will try to tell us, but we really don't know. You see, our vision is for today and for yesterday. We really can't see into tomorrow very well. But here's the good news. The God we serve sees tomorrow perfectly. He's already created your tomorrows. So when we are looking at tomorrow and holding ourselves in a position of fear, God is saying, quit worrying about it. I've got it. It's in my hand. It's already planned out. All you have to do is trust the living God. 1933, just before Adolf Hitler came to power in Germany, there was a German theologian, a Lutheran pastor, many of you have heard his name, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who stood in his pulpit and preached a message about the certainty of God's presence in the midst of uncertainty and fear. He was no more certain of the future than anyone else in Germany. He couldn't see what tomorrow would hold. Oh, he could read the landscape. He knew things were changing. He didn't like what he saw, but he had to bring a word to the people of God. And this is what he said. In uncertain times, remember, God stands above all. His word is unstayed. This is the time, he said, when God is incredibly close to you, not far away, Right there, when everything else that keeps us safe is breaking down and falling down, when one after another, all the things our lives depend on are being taken away or destroyed, where we have to learn to give them up, all this is happening because God is coming near to us. Because God wants to be our only support and certainty. God wants to show us that when you let everything go, listen to this statement, When you lose all your own security, when you have to give it up, that's when you're totally free to receive from God. And that's when you will be totally safe in the hand of God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer continued to be a cause and a voice for righteousness for the church of Jesus Christ trying to rally Germans away from the Nazi regime toward the cross of Christ. From 1933 till 1945, he continued to raise his voice against Adolf Hitler and decree the grace, the love, the mercy in Jesus Christ. In April 23rd of 1945, he'd been arrested the year previous. April 23rd, he was executed by the Nazis. It's interesting that a month later, the Allies overcame Germany and won the victory in Europe. 
But for that entire time, he continued to say, in times of uncertainty, we trust God. So I've come to tell you this morning, church, in times of uncertainty, like we live in today, we can either be like Moses and we can offer up excuses as to why we can't. Or we can stand like Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And we can say, when I don't know what tomorrow holds, I still know who holds my tomorrow. I will not fear. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but he's given me power and love and a sound mind. I can stand on Romans chapter 8, verse 15, for Paul said, he has not given me a spirit of bondage again to fear, but a spirit of adoption, whereby I cry, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, I will not fear what men can do to me. My eyes are on the Lord. Oh, come on, stand to your feet with me in this room. You're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I'm dealing with some issues that are greater than me. I'm dealing with some things in my past that I can't overcome. You said that God would forgive me. You said that God would give me an opportunity. I need him to do that for me today. I need him to forgive me, to cleanse me, to come into my life, to help me during this day and this time. That's you. We're not bowing our heads this morning. There is no shame in coming to Jesus Christ. But that's you. I've just described you. You've got things in your life that are keeping you back, that are separating you from God, and it's time to be free. You say, that's me. I need Jesus to forgive me. I need him to cleanse me. I need him to change my life today and in doing so, change my future. Right where you stand across this room, that's you. Raise your hand with mine. Say, pray for me. Yes, 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 others. Yes, 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 others. Across this place, others. I need Jesus to do something in me. Everybody with your hand raised, come right now. Come right now. Step out. We're going to pray a prayer of faith. We're going to believe God for victory. We're going to believe God for liberty. Come on, across this house this morning. You need God to do something in your heart and in your life today to break a bondage, to set it free, to forgive your past, to move you forward. Come on, others, you raise your hands to out and come this morning. Thank you for listening to audio from Christian Heritage Church located in Tallahassee, Florida. Feel free to give copies of this message to others, but do not charge for those copies or alter the content in any way without permission. For more information about Christian Heritage Church, please visit us online at chctoday.com.